appeal to the brand's uh, um, identity. And then we can see that if that influencer uh, was to post about the brand, that this is uh, the audience that that brand could reach. And this is, I guess, the value of that audience. And so we can then connect that brand to that influencer to create uh, some branded content. Uh, and the collaboration between them uh, is matches the media value that they generate in terms of what they what the brand gives them or pays them. Of highly sophisticated geotargeting, uh, mapping of social media and discussions. Is that right? Yeah, and I guess the real trick then is uh, to because you, as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, social media activity. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, I guess, different topics of, of conversation. But what we're able to do is to find those people in those audiences that match that, that brand so that we're getting the right brand into the right uh, audiences and social media influences. Social media is <laughs> all sorts of discussions going there. There's all sorts of information, and it's it's a yeah. it's a massive amount of information. How do you actually distill the right amount of information, the the right details? Because I, I'd imagine that would be absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> it, it was, uh, and I guess this is part of um, our process. And one of the really amazing insights that we had, uh, which which was that location is key that's all it's all about context uh, and with our tool we're able to be very targeted in in the in the areas that we're searching so rather than uh say you know searching the whole of uh the bondi suburb which you can imagine would be everybody talking about from fish and chips to uh sweaters to you name it <laughs> um we can put a geofence over uh, the, the Beach Road Hotel, for example. And so we really narrow down uh, the social media that's generated in that location. So we can distill, yeah, even down to the bar level or to, you know, picnic table. <laughs> so you would have to know exactly where geographically you're targeting. Exactly, yeah. And that's part of uh, what we do as well with our... Uh, marketing activities is we understand, we get to understand the brand and then we find locations that are aligned to, to that brand. But that would take a lot of, a lot of um, intelligence gathering, wouldn't it? Um, I, I wouldn't say a lot. It's, and with the tool, it's pretty easy for us to uh, drop a location over the Clock Hotel, for example, if we're looking for, or even a restaurant, it might be the Rock Pool in Sydney, if we're looking for foodie influences, then we just need to know what are the top uh, restaurants in Sydney. And that's a quick Google. <laughs> that's right, yeah. And, and what about the technology that you use? Uh, so it's technology that we've developed ourselves, um, which uh, integrates various platforms such as Google Maps, social media channels and brings all of that together uh, into an integrated uh, research tool um, that gives us a pretty easy interface uh, to, 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 to drop those geofenced search areas. So and it's a pretty easy workflow for us to just, if you can imagine Google Maps and then dropping a circle on an area and then pressing a search button that's that's about as <laughs> difficult as it is how long did it take you to develop that technology so it's taken about two years for us to get to the point where we are now uh which is a fairly refined tool um and that's and and so we're we're now able to use the tool ourselves to do marketing campaigns for our own uh, clients and the brands that we work with. Um, and we're, we're now at a stage where we're going to start to scale up our operation and that's going to require us to 
to develop a bit more uh, capability into the platform, and then we'll offer that out to other agencies and companies to use themselves. Which who would be your main clients for this uh, Mapcats? Which which kind of companies go for this? It's going to be marketing agencies or PR agencies who need to be able to firstly know who the influential people are in social media and then, uh, I guess, create marketing campaigns that match the value of those social media uh, influencers out there, which is that's the really hard thing for agencies and PR companies to do now. Well, it sounds like this particular tool is a godsend for marketing and PR agencies. Yeah, I think so. Um, and we've, uh, we're working with a couple of agencies now, more as sort of, uh, I guess, brought in specialists in this capability. And uh, so we're working with people from uh, in Sydney to London and the States um, and starting to speak with people in Dubai and, and we're getting some pretty good feedback on it so yeah that, that's i guess the key customer type is marketing agencies and pr companies. and it's a, it's a good australian innovation absolutely well andrew it's been delightful talking to you thank you very much for your time and now let's talk to indeed economist callum pickering callum pickering what are the big trends in the labor market for the next 10 years well, the labour market's likely to change a great deal um, over the next decade. It's certainly changed a lot over the, the previous decade. I think we will, to some extent, see some continuations of recent trends. Um, I anticipate that part-time employment will continue to, to rise as a share of total employment. Uh, flexibility in the workplace is is really um, is something that a lot of workers want these days, and I think that the labour market will continue to shape around that. In terms of the industries that are likely to be strongest over the next decade, I think we will, we will continue to see a lot of strength in healthcare and aged care services due to the ageing of Australia's population. We'll continue to adapt to that ongoing challenge. Um, and we're also likely to see ongoing strength just more broadly in the service sector. The Australian the labour market is increasingly service-based. It accounts for around 80% of all employment um, today. Uh, that share is likely to increase further into the future as well. So which, so apart from aged care, which other industries do you see taking off in the services sector? Uh, would it be <laughs> hospitality? Would it be uh, tourism? Hospitality and tourism are going to be two of, of the big ones. Um, Australia's got very strong population growth and the service sector will evolve um, to account for that. Hospitality will be a key part of that. The tourism sector is also likely to be quite strong, if only because we continue to see the growth of Chinese travellers. Um, and over the next decade, we could see um, a vast increase, not just in Chinese travellers, but also um, travellers from India as well, as um, their populations move into sort of the middle income uh, region where you begin to travel a little bit more. And I think Australia would be a key destination for that and benefit from that from a labour market perspective. Uh, unemployment's been stuck around, well, the last figures were 5.3%. Uh, there, there has been massive job growth of late. Where do you see the figures trending towards? Do you see it heading below 5% or do you see it still staying around 5%? Well, we certainly hope that it heads below 5%. I think the Reserve Bank and other policymakers would be pretty disappointed if it didn't. Um, the Australian labour market has continued to improve, but, but it's been a gradual process. Um, as you said, the unemployment rate's down to 5.3%, but has steadily declined over the past 12 to 18 months. Um, certainly, if the employment growth we've recently seen continues, then I would expect it to uh, certainly approach 5% over the next 12 to 18 months. The economy looks like it's about to produce around 270 um, new jobs this year, uh, following 400,000 last year. Um, 270,000 new jobs? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. Yes, following from 400,000 last year. And that sort of growth is more than sufficient to bring the unemployment rate down. So where do you see it trending down towards? I mean, it's, it's very low in, in the US, it's low in the UK. Do you see it heading down to those levels? Well, it's... It's a very interesting question because the labour market has fundamentally changed from where it was a decade ago. So a decade ago, we did get the unemployment rate down to around 4% at the peak of the mining boom. 
Since then, there has been this massive increase in part-time employment, right? So when we talk about labor market slack today, it's not so much the unemployment rate, which is important, it's actually the broader measure that we call the underutilization rate, okay? So it's quite possible that the unemployment rate could get down to 4%, but that's not gonna be the same as an unemployment rate of 4%, say a decade ago, because of this part-time component. So I certainly wouldn't be surprised if the unemployment rate got down to that sort of level over, say, the next two or three years. It's certainly trending in that direction. But the key for the Australian economy and the labour market broadly is how much lower the underutilisation rate can go, because that's still incredibly high at the moment. Well, that's interesting because there's a very high underemployment rate, isn't there? Yep. So the underemployment rate is currently 8% which is only slightly below its highest level in history. Um, by comparison, back in 1990, when the labour market was very different, the um, underemployment rate was just 4%. So there has been that big transformation over that period of time. And for the Australian labour market to become tight, for the Australian labour market to begin to produce much higher wage growth, we do need to see these broader measures of unemployment come down a lot more than they currently have. Well, what about mining? I mean, a lot's been said about the mining industry. It's going through a new boom, for example. Do you see that putting on a lot of more jobs? Well, the mining sector has never been a big employer. Um, they're a highly influential um, industry of the economy, but in terms of actual number of people working in the mining sector, it's never been a, a big employer. What it could trigger, though, um, is that the mining sector has a lot of money. Um, they often pay very high wages and they can compete um, compete for, for staff. We saw this from 2003 till around 2013, when the mining sector was desperate to attract staff from other places in the country. And so they lifted wages and that caused people to move. What we could begin to see as the mining sector continues to improve is that they'll start looking to get workers from interstate. And when that begins to happen, they're gonna start paying higher wages. And that could in turn cause other industries and sectors of the economy um, to sort of retaliate in a way, um, and that could lead to higher wages in the future across the board. But there is, there is a profound issue here with wages growth. It remains very, very low. Uh, what are the signs? That, uh, obviously, the latest figures look encouraging, but there's obviously still a very long way to go, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. There's sort of light at the end of the tunnel. we have sort of gradual improvement. We're still a long way away from where we need to be. Um, wage, private sector wage growth in Australia is 2.1% over the past year. Um, Australians were once accustomed to 3%, 4% annual pay rises. Um, and that just hasn't been the case over the past five years. There's a, a variety of reasons why this is the case. The underutilisation story is one key part of that. Um, but there are certainly other factors Low levels of unionisation, for example, is one. Um, a deregulated labour market just in general has sort of reduced some of the power that workers once had in terms of negotiating higher wages. Um, and there's also the potential that, um, so in a lot of industries, it's the employer that has a lot of the, the power. Right? A, lot of the, a lot of the industries in Australia are highly concentrated with only a, a few sort of big employers. And when that tends to be the case, it's the employer that has a lot of power rather than the employee because the employee often doesn't have a lot of uh, different alternatives to where they can go and work. The good news is that Australian businesses have begun to perform a lot better. Um, corporate earnings growth has been strong, profitability is up. So for the first time in a number of years, um, Australian businesses are actually in a place where they could potentially pay higher wages. It's just whether the economy gets strong enough to force them to. Right. Right, right. And uh, but there's, a, there's another profound issue. I mean, the lack of wages growth has uh, fueled low consumer confidence, but business confidence is also fairly down as well. Yeah, it was, um, business confidence was quite high throughout most of last year. It has um, soured a little bit um, this year. And it's sort of hard to pinpoint exactly, well, precisely what has changed uh, between now and, and last year. It could just be the realisation that the economy sort of hasn't picked up the way businesses might have expected. Um, so that'll be an interesting issue um, going forward because business confidence is often the key uh, for employment growth. Now, employment growth has been strong last year and continues to be quite strong 
this year, but if business sentiment continues to head um, in a downward direction, then that could definitely weigh on employment and wages over the remainder of the year. So when do you see wages will start picking up? I mean, if it's not this year, do you see it happening next year? Or? Well, we saw a modest improvement in the June quarter. It was the strongest um, single quarter growth we'd seen in about six years. Um, so that's pointing in the right direction. But I don't think we'll see a sort of material improvement um, until early next year based on sort of the measures of underutilisation. Um, so what we've seen is that the underutilisation rate has improved um, a fair bit over the past 12 months, but usually it takes maybe six to nine months for that improvement to then translate into higher wages. Well, the other big question then is where does that leave the RBA? Well, the key for the RBA is higher wages, and until they see higher wages, they're unlikely to, to increase rates because without high wage growth, they're unlikely to see uh, much higher inflation. So a lot of economists are saying uh, the, an RBA rate hike is probably a 2020 story. Do you agree with that? That seems reasonable. Um, it seems unlikely at this point that wage growth will increase sufficiently over the course of 2019 to justify a move. 2020 appears a more likely scenario at this point. Which is a bit scary seeing a lot of economists are predicting that the US is going to slip into recession in 2020. <laughs> Well, the US economy is certainly overdue for a recession. They've had uh, quite a good run um, mm. since they bottomed out back in there around 2010. Yeah. Um, so it certainly wouldn't be surprising if they did dip into a recession, particularly when you consider some of these trade issues um, yes. that get talked about a lot. I mean, hopefully it, it won't be the case. Hopefully the US will continue to um, strengthen in the years to come, and that would certainly help us. Um, but yes, if the, um, the US economy does head south, then that could very well push back um, RBA rate hike until... Whenever. Yeah, whenever. <laughs> it's been a long time and it could be, um, you know, a long time before we do see a rate hike. Well, Callum Pickering, it's, it's delightful talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much for having me. So what's happening in the news? Well, China has called off planned trade talks with the US. The decision comes in the wake of a US State Department sanctions against China's Defence Agency and its director last week and its tariffs on Chinese goods. There's a growing consensus in Beijing that substantive talks will only be possible with the Trump administration after the US midterm elections in November. In a significant escalation, $200 billion of Chinese products are now subject to tariffs. And that's on top of the $50 billion in goods already slapped with tariffs earlier in the year. The big question now is, will President Donald Trump follow up with additional tariffs covering that amount of Chinese goods as he threatened to do if China retaliated to his $200 billion salvo? That would effectively cover all the products that the US imports from China. And doing that will ratchet up a conflict that could undermine the global expansion and upend the supply chains of many multinational companies. And JP Morgan Chase and company strategists are starting to make forecasts and strategy changes around the potential that President Donald Trump gets so overconfident in the robust economy and markets that he makes a major miscalculation. The worry is that US economic and equity market resilience despite tariffs will embolden the President on all geopolitical fronts, autos, NAFTA, and particularly Iran, and thus risk a major miscalculation from sanctions that are tough to calibrate, according to strategists led by John Norman, and they wrote that in a note for clients. JP Morgan also is starting to factor into its strategy a growing potential for a phase three of a US-China trade war next year, affecting all Chinese imports. That could, the strategists say, lead to weaker Chinese growth and hit the commodities complex, not to mention US stocks. And oil prices have jumped to the highest level for nearly four years after Saudi Arabia and Russia ruled out any immediate increase in production. The decision on Sunday was effectively a rebuff to US President Donald Trump, who has called for immediate action to raise global supply. Brent crude rose more than 3% to more than $81 a barrel on Monday, its highest level since November 2014. Saudi Arabia dominates the OPEC group of oil producing nations, and Russia is its biggest oil producer ally outside the group. They have reportedly been discussing raising output by half a million barrels a day to counter falling supply from Iran. But a meeting of OPEC and non-OPEC energy ministers in Algiers ended without any formal recommendation for a supply boost. Mr Trump said last week that OPEC must get its prices down. 
Experts estimate that once US sanctions on Iran are fully implemented from November, it could result in the loss of as many as 2 million barrels a day from global supply. And to Australia. And the federal government recorded an underlying cash deficit of $10.1 billion in the year to June, a $19.3 billion improvement on budget forecasts according to the final budget outcome. The net operating deficit was $4 billion, or $15.8 billion better, than the deficit of $19.8 billion estimated at the time of the budget. Total revenue was $456.3 billion, or $11.9 billion higher than budget estimates. Tax collected was $427.4 billion, or $12 billion higher than expected. Total expenses were $460.3 billion, or $4 billion lower than estimated. Net debt for 2017-18 was $342 billion, or 18.6% of GDP. Treasurer Josh Frydenberg said the underlying cash deficit at $10.1 billion, or just 0.6% of GDP, is the smallest in 10 years. And the Prudential Regulator is worried banks have spent too little maintaining computer systems, which could lead to more IT outages, further eroding trust in the financial systems. And it's warned them to boost investment spending. Australian Prudential and Regulation Authority Chairman Wayne Burrs warned this week that a backlog of maintenance jobs across a patchwork of systems reflected a period of persistent underinvestment in information technology and banks are underprepared for the government's new credit reporting and open banking regimes. The health of the system's environment and associated risks have not been as well understood by peak decision makers as they should be, he told an event hosted by Cuskell. In a wide-ranging speech on technological disruption, a rare topic for APRA, Mr Burrs provided a disturbing health check on the state of the bank IT systems. While praising banks' recent focus on information security, the quality of data, he said, needs to improve. Each of the major banks spends around $1 billion on technology each year, with a significant portion of that dedicated to keeping existing systems running. National Australian Bank announced earlier this year it would lift spending in an ambitious automation program. But Mr Burrs has now flagged that other banks may need to follow a move that would raise costs, a key concern for banking analysts and investors. Pointing to a challenge for incumbents as they face disruption from fintechs and global technology players, Mr Burrs said it was a concern to APRA that banks' understandable desire to invest in new technology-enabled products and services, coupled with the necessary investment in cybersecurity and risk mitigation, comes at the expense of ongoing maintenance of existing technology platforms. And Fairfax Media's New Zealand arm, Stuff, and NZME Limited will not be able to merge, according to the Court of Appeal. The two businesses, which first flagged intentions to merge in 2016, hit another blockage after the Court of Appeal rejected the merger proposal. Now, under the initial plans, NZME would pay New Zealand $55 million to acquire Fairfax New Zealand's assets, with Fairfax Media Group gaining a 41% share in the company. But the initial merger with proposal was blocked by the New Zealand Commerce Commission in May of 2017 due to concerns over diversity of choice. The two businesses decided to appeal the decision in the High Court, but in December last year, the High Court decided the merger could not go ahead. Adamant the merger was in the best interest of shareholders in the New Zealand media industry, Fairfax Media and NZME appealed the High Court's decision. Now, the High Court of Appeal declined the merger proposal. And NZME CEO Michael Boggs said he was disappointed by the decision, arguing the merger is in the best interests of NZME's shareholders and the New Zealand media industry. The business will review the judgment and consider its options. The third rejection of the merger proposal comes as Fairfax Media waits a merger with nine. And superannuation, stored value travel cards and cryptocurrency are increasingly being used for money laundering by sophisticated criminals, according to Australia's Financial Intelligence Agency. Brad Brown, Deputy Chief Executive of the Australian Transaction Reports and Analysis Centre, or Austrac, said money launderers and criminal groups financing terror were exploiting new technology to move illicit money around the world. Mr Brown said the financial services were vulnerable, with both retail and industry superannuation funds potential targets of money launderers constantly seeking loopholes to exploit. And AGL Energy is in trouble again with Victoria's Essential Services Commission after it was slugged with a record penalty of almost $3 million for failing to meet its liability under the state's energy efficiency regulations. The $2.9 million fine, divided between two separate AGL agencies, dwarfs the previous highest penalty of 38000 levied by the Victorian regulator. 
And this came days after Victoria's energy regulator threatened to revoke AGL's licence to sell gas and electricity in the state unless it provides correct customer complaints data by the end of October. Earlier this month, Victoria's Essential Services Commission told AGL to get its house in order after it was revealed the retailer's data on performance, customer complaints, hardship levels and customers' debt was inaccurate. And Australian biotech Immutep has landed two giants of the pharmaceuticals industry, Merck and Pfizer, as partners in an early stage clinical trial of its drug candidate in treating cancerous tumours. The cancer drug developer said it had entered into a collaboration and supply agreement with the two companies. And coal miner Coronado Global Resources is seeking to raise up to $1.39 billion for its Australian initial public offering. According to terms sent to potential investors on Monday morning, the miner's IPO is priced at $4 to $4.80 which would value the company at $3.8 billion to $4.4 billion. And Westpac Group, the nation's second largest lender, is giving risky property investors less than one month to find another lender, amid growing concerns about the impact of rising rates, falling values and oversupply. The bank sent a single-page letter to investors with a warning that it can no longer support our commercial relationship with you, adding it will work with the borrower to help them find a new lender. And Santos has outlined a strategy to lift production to more than 100 million barrels by 2025, almost doubles its existing output, based on expansion in LNG as well as its core Cooper Basin acreage and its recent acquisition of Quadrant Energy. In a presentation to investors in Sydney, Chief Executive Kevin Gallagher pointed to the progress the oil and gas producer has made since the start of 2016 in cutting costs, restoring the balance sheet, selling non-core assets and reinstating dividend payments. He said Santos, which rejected a $14.4 billion takeover bid earlier this year from US suitor Harbour Energy, is, in his words, now positioned for disciplined growth leveraging existing infrastructure in all five of our assets in the portfolio and are targeting production of more than 100 million barrels of oil equivalent by 2025. He said growth projects include developing the Barossa gas field off the north coast to supply the Darwin LNG project, the expansion of the PNG LNG venture, the acquisition of a stake in the Pyongyang gas field. Expansion is also seen in the Cooper Basin at the GNLG venture in Queensland and in eastern Queensland more generally, and from quadrant assets, specifically the recent Dorado oil discovery. And that's it for this week. And next week I have a terrific interview with Alex Wilcock. And he runs a company called Maker & Son in the UK. And they make prime furniture, prime sofas and footstools, And it's an extraordinary company, and they're looking for Australian investors. It's a great interview. In the meantime, you can keep up with me on Twitter at TalkingBizBLZ or on Facebook.